Originally from Albuquerque, New Mexico, Olivia Gatwood has received national recognition for her poetry, writing workshops, and work as a Title IX complaint educator in sexual assault prevention and recovery. As a finalist at Brave New Voices, Women of the World, and the National Poetry Slam, Olivia is an active member of the slam poetry community and has been featured on HBO, Verses and Flow, Button Poetry, Huffington Post, and others. Olivia has traveled nationally to perform and teach workshops on gender equality, sexuality, and social justice at over 70 colleges and 30 high schools nationwide. Her Amazon best-selling collection, New American Best Friend, reflects her experiences growing up in both New Mexico and Trinidad, navigating girlhood puberty relationships and period underwear. Olivia is a former member and co-founder of Speak Like a Girl and was an artist in residence at the Chatham School for Girls alongside celebrated leaders such as Venus Williams and Gloria Steinem. Online, her videos including Manic Pixie Girl, Man Manic Pixie Dream Girl, and Oh My Bitch Face have gained over 3 million views collectively. <laughs> Olivia believes in girl power. She resides in Boston, but tonight she's in Houston, Texas. I'm right about now. Please put your hands together and send all the love you have for your feature Olivia. Yeah. a shirt, you know? That's awesome, so thank you for having me. I'm gonna start off with a true story about the time Jordan convinced me that pads are disgusting. They make your panties smell like dirty bike chains, she said. We were sitting on her mother's plastic-coated floral couch, one of us in a swimsuit, the other sworn to layers. The water was her selling point, and I was terrified of tampons, or rather, terrified of the undiscovered crater, the muscle that holds and pulls and keeps and sheds. She said, I'll do it for you. And yes, we had seen each other naked many times. We had showered together and compared nipples, wished to trade the smalls and bigs of our respective bodies. So it wasn't unnatural, really, when I squatted on the toilet seat and she lay down on the floor like a mechanic investigating the underbelly of a car. <laughs> With plastic syringe in hand, she wedged the packed cotton into me. This is what I saw last, before blacking out and collapsing onto the tile. Jordan, blood scholar, in a turquoise bikini, saying, now you are ready to swim. Thank you. That's a true story. Um, my best friend put a tampon in for me, and I blacked out. So like, I wanna tell you about the second time I put a tampon in, because I'm a chronic oversharer, and I don't understand boundaries. <laughs> Great. Um, no, I do, I do, I do. I teach, I teach about consent for a living. Okay, so, um, the second time I put a tampon in was like a year later, right? Because it made me black out, and I was like, those are things of the devil, I'm a girl of the Lord, like, keep me far away. <laughs> So a year c comes by and like I have to do it because convenience, whatever. Now I use Diva Cups. If you want to know more about them, you can come speak to me. Okay? But at this point in time, I was still using tampons. So I put one tampon in. I'm like, dope. I did it. Cool. We're good to go. Time passes. I'm like, I'm going to do this again. So I put another tampon in. Now, yep, thank you. What's missing from that equation is the part where I take the first tampon out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I go to consult my mother who works at Planned Parenthood and has done many a gynecological exam. And I was like, mom, I lost a tampon inside of my body. <laughs> and my mom is like, mm, that's anatomically impossible. The vagina is only three to five inches long. You can't lose anything inside of you. She just had to reach far enough. And I was like, I hear you, but also, I put one tampon in, then I put another tampon in, I only took one tampon out. So mathematically, a tampon is lost inside of my body. 
And my mom was like, lay down on the floor, let me take a look. I was like, here we go again, will my body ever be my own? Like, plot twist it long, okay. <laughs> so I lay down on the ground, and my mom like looks, have you guys seen Stranger Things? <laughs> you know when they go into the upside down? Um, so she enters, and then she comes out, and she's like, good news, there is no tampon inside of you. Also good news, we have identical vaginas. Um, that's the end of that story. Thank you. I like to tell that story to everybody that I have sex with so that when they go down on me, they think of my mom. <laughs> yep, just doing the Lord's work. One thing I never say about that poem, because I, I do that poem and tell that story at a lot of colleges where I'm like, supposed to be professional or something. Um, the part that's, people are always like, where did the tampon go, right? <laughs> what happened? Here's the thing, I had smoked two blunts before that, and I think I literally took the tampon out and just like didn't remember. Um, I was one of those teenagers that was like, let's smoke so much weed that we just like stop being high. Like, let's smoke ourselves in a circle, you know? <laughs> And that's when you start taking shit out of your body and don't remember it. All right. Who here knows what period underwear is? Great, awesome. Um, so for those of you who didn't applaud, uh, period underwear is underwear if you are a human with a period that you purchase because you think you have your shit together and you're like, I don't bleed in my underwear and you don't have your shit together. You never will. And so you bleed in it, and then you're like, fuck it. And then you reserve it to bleed in it every single month until the end of time. So, um, yeah, so I, I like to write odes to things I feel like I'm supposed to be ashamed of, which is what shame is. We're told we're supposed to feel it. We're handed it by other people, which makes it a very interesting emotion. It doesn't come from us. And it doesn't matter how evolved or progressive you are. You can, you can think that you're immune to it and you're not. Someone tells you to be ashamed of the way that you speak or where you come from or how you love or how you pray and suddenly you are. So I was ashamed of the mess my body makes for a long time, mostly because of the show Room Raiders. Does anyone remember this show? Yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> yeah. So, Room Raiders was a dating show in the early 2000s on MTV where strangers would go into other strangers' bedrooms and then they would like look through their rooms and choose who they wanted to date based on if they liked their rooms or not, right? And the idea was that the person like didn't know that, the per that they were about to be on Room Raiders, which is a total lie. But at the time, I didn't know that. So I thought these people were like ripped from their bedrooms and this was just how their rooms looked all the time. There was always a scene where probably a dude went to probably a girl's underwear drawer. And that was the moment where you like realized sex was a thing. You know, when you're like 12 watching it, you're like, holy fuck, people have sex. <laughs> um, and they would pull out like a perfectly manicured G-string. And they'd be like, yeah, this is the girl I'm gonna choose. And I would look at that scene and I'd be like, God for fucking bid anybody looks in my underwear drawer. So anyway. That's a long way of saying I wrote a note to my period underwear, great. I didn't purchase you as such. You grew into the role. Earned your name after the first stain and admittedly now I am careless with your fabric. No fear of the overflow. As I trust you will not mind another scar and yes, once you were brand new. Bought in the name of some boy who I wished to see me unmarked and clean as his mother's kitchen counter. Perhaps once you were even called the good pair, which is not to say you are the opposite now, but that you gave new meaning to the phrase in the way that a good car is often one with six digits in the odometer. Isn't that the greatest evolution for something to be good and then to become more good in its thorough use, you keeper of a thousand not pregnant surprise parties. <laughs> Instigator of the exhale. Proof that no matter how many years I have spent here, I will never get the hang of this. And even though I have shoved you to the back of the drawer, strategically folded so that your forever mess was not revealed, I have also reveled in the fossil of you. 
Yes, you. Relic of age 13 and also 23. Hoarder of the blot. We all have at least one of you to slide up our winter legs, wiggle in your loose grip, and this too is a kind of ceremony. The choosing of you, I mean. And the washing too. The folding and wearing and washing again, and at last the ruin, the ritual of the spill, your national anthem, your ever-changing flag. Make some noise if you're enjoying your feature. I will not be long. I will just say that we are going to pass this tip jar to show our love because she traveled. She's on the road. She's here. She's in snow. Let's get her some coffee or something warm or like a slice of pizza. Make some noise for Olivia Gatwood. All the okay. time you want. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my merch is like, I have seven books left. <laughs> um, but also, you can totally order a book from me here, and I'll send it to you in the mail later. So that can be a thing if you trust me with your money, um, which you should. And so, and I'll send it to you, and I'll write a little note in it, which is better than Amazon. So you can do that. I also have T-shirts. I only have, I don't have any. I have one, but it's a sample <laughs> shirt to show you what they look like. I've been on the road for a long time. Um, so you can also order those. And I also have bitch greeting cards, which you can buy for the bitch in your life. They say all kinds of things, like, I love you, bitch. Happy birthday, bitch. I love your bitch face, you fucking bitch. Um, buy it for someone who likes being called a bitch, not for someone who doesn't. All right. Speaking of that, ode to my bitch face. You pink armor, lipstick rebel, steel cheek, slit mouth, head to the ground, mean girl. You headphones in, but no music. You house key turned blade. You quick step between street lights, strainer of pricks and chest beaters. Laughter is a foreign language to your dry ice tongue. Resting bitch face, they call you. But there is nothing restful about you. No, lips like a flat-lined heartbeat, panic at the sight of you, scream for their mothers, throat full of bees, head spun 360, exorcist bitch. Just trying to buy a soda, just trying to do your laundry, just trying to dance at the party when someone asks you to smile and the blood begins to riot. Smile and you chisel away at your own jaw. Smile and you unleash the swarm into the mouth of a man who wants to swallow you whole. One theory is that you were born like this, but I don't believe it. You came out screaming and alive, and look at you now. Look at how you've learned to hide your teeth. What's wrong with your face, bitch? Your face, bitch, what's wrong with it? Bitch face, I don't blame you for taking the iron pipe from their hands and branding yourself with it, for making a flag out of your body bag. Another theory is that you put it on every morning. Screw it tight like a jar of jelly, but I don't believe that either. You woke up like this and have been for years. How can you sleep pretty when there are four locks on the door and the fire escape feels like break-in bait? They will tell you home is safe zone. No, bitch face is safe zone. Yeah. Bitch face is home. Bitch face is cutting off the ladder, willing to burn in the apartment if it means he can't get in. So three more poems is great. All right. Um, cool, 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 cool. <laughs> Let me find this poem because it's kind of new. All right. Yeah. I mean, it's not that new. You might have seen it on the internet. But it's new in that it doesn't exist in a book yet. So that's new enough. Great. When I say that we are all teen girls. Yeah. So you saw it on the internet. <laughs> You're like, bitch, that's not new. <laughs> what I mean is that when my grandmother called to ask why I didn't respond to her letter, all I heard was, why didn't you text me back? Why don't you love me? And how can I talk about my grandmother without also mentioning that if everyone is a teen girl, then so are the birds. They're soaring clicks, they're squawking throats, and the sea, of course the sea, it's moody push and pull, the way we drill into it, fill it with our trash, take and take and take from it, and still it holds us each time we walk into it. What is more teen girl than not being loved, but wanting it so badly that you accept the smallest crumb and call yourself 
full. What is more teen girl than my father's favorite wrench? It's eternal loyalty and willingness to loosen the most stubborn of bolts. What is more teen girl than my dog Jack? whose bark is shrill and unnecessary, who has never once stopped a burglar or healed on command, but sometimes when I laugh, his tail wags so hard it thumps against the wall. Sometimes it sounds like a heartbeat. Sometimes he waits at the door and squeals at my arrival. Sometimes I yell at him for talking too much, for his messy room. Sometimes I put him in pink striped polos, and I think he feels pretty. I think he likes to feel pretty. I think Jack is a teen girl and the mountains, oh the mountains, what teen girls they are. Those colossal show-offs and the moon glittering and distant and dictating all of our emotions. My lover's tender but heavy breath while she sleeps is a teen girl. How it holds me and keeps me awake all at once. How sometimes I wish to silence it until she turns her body and the room goes quiet and suddenly I want it back. Imagine the teen girls gone from our world and how quickly we would beg for their return. How grateful would we be then for their loud enthusiasm and ability to make a crop top out of anything. Even the men who laugh their condescending laughs when a teen girl faints at the sight of her favorite pop star, even those men are teen girls. The way they want so badly to be big and important and worshiped by someone. Donald Trump, teen girl, and his tiny tweeting hands. Pluto teen girl and her rejection from the popular universe and my father a teen girl who insists he doesn't believe in horoscopes but wants me to tell him the best traits of a scorpio i tell him we are all just teen girls and my father having raised me recounts the time he found the box of love notes and condom wrappers i hid in my closet all of the bloody sheets the missing socks the radio blaring over my pitchy sobs, the time I was certain I would die of heartbreak and in a moment was in love with a small new boy. And of course, there are the teen girls, the real teen girls, huddled on the subway after school, limbs draped over each other's shoulders, bones knocking an awkward wind chime, and all of the commuters who plug in their headphones to mute the giggle, silence the gaggle and squeak, not knowing where they learned to do this to roll their eyes and turn up the music, not knowing where they learned this palpable rage, not knowing the teen girls are our most distinguished professors who teach us to bury the burst until we close our bedroom doors and then cry with blood in the neck, foot through the door, face in the pillow, the teen girls who teach us to scream. <laughs> So I'm a Pisces sun with a Scorpio moon, which is why I'm deeply emotional and always a disaster. And um, also, my dad is like a deeply godless man. I grew up in a very godless household. I feel like I had an opposite experience from a lot of people I know. Like I grew up like not being allowed to talk about God. And then I left, I was like, thank goodness, I can finally pray. Um, yeah, like the worst thing you can say to my dad is mention like anything about like fate. Like I'll be like, yeah, I think I was meant to be a poet. And he'll be like, you think you were meant to be a poet? Really? It's not because of your hard work, Olivia, with your devotion and talent. Um, but yeah, I, he's a Scorpio, but he doesn't believe in horoscopes, of course. And, but then I came home and was really into astrology and he like got sort of interested but wouldn't really give it to me and then he was like, well, tell me about your mom and I's compatibility. And I was like, okay, sure. So my dad's a Scorpio, my mom's a Libra. And I was like, so you know the Scorpio, right? <laughs> so I was like, the Scorpio might get kind of jealous because the Libra is an air sign and is flirtatious and kind of moves around with ease and doesn't let anything affect them. And, but that, that, that hurts the Scorpio's feelings, right? Because the Scorpio is a water sign and is really invested and emotional. And I'm giving him all this and my dad is suddenly like deeply invested. And he's like, yeah, that does sound like your mother. Yeah, it's true. Um, so now he loves horoscopes. Okay. Speaking of love, I guess that's a segue. Um, people who are shitty to you don't love you. And, yep, that's the truth. <laughs> so, I know that seems obvious, but I think we learn the opposite when we're growing up. I think we learn that people who are bad to us um, have, like us, right? From the time we're very small, we learn that people who are bullies actually have a crush on us. And then we grow up and we learn that people who are possessive and controlling just want the best for us, right? Um, and it took me a really long time to unlearn this, 
to realize that love is not a riddle to be solved, but something that should be easy and obvious and loud. And when it comes, it should not be a burden to you in any way or something you have to convince yourself exists. So I encourage you to like accept nothing less for yourself. Um, but anyway, there was one summer where I was grieving over someone who didn't love me. I realized I had bought a bicycle and hadn't been outside once and ridden it. So I got really mad because I thought I was better than that, but I wasn't clearly. So I started to imagine a world where I didn't do those things, or I didn't grieve people who didn't love me. So this is an alternate universe in which I am unfazed by the men who do not love me. When the businessman shoulder checks me in the airport, I do not apologize. Instead, I write him an elegy on the back of a receipt and tuck it in his hand as I pass through the first class cabin. Like a bee, he will die after stinging me. I am 24 and have never cried. Once, a boy told me he doesn't believe in labels, so I embroidered the word chauvinist on the back of his favorite coat. A boy said he liked my hair the other way, so I shaved my head instead of my pussy. While the boy isn't calling back, I learn carpentry, build a desk, write a book at the desk. I tell myself to come from counting ceiling tiles. The boy says he prefers blondes and I steam clean his clothes with bleach. The boy says I am not marriage material and I put gravel in his pepper grinder. The boy says period sex is disgusting and I slaughter a goat in his living room. The boy does not ask if he can choke me, so I pretend to die while he's doing it. My mother says this is not the meaning of unfazed. When the boy says I curse too much to be pretty and I tattoo cunt on my inner lip, my mother calls this being very phased. Olivia. But left over from the other universe are hours and hours of waiting for him to kiss me and here, they are just hours. Here, they are a bike ride across Long Island in June. Here, there are a novel read in one sitting. Here, there are arguments about God or a full night's sleep. Here, I hand an hour to the woman crying outside of the bar. Leave one on my best friend's front porch. Send my mother two in the mail. I do not slice his tires. I do not burn the photos. I do not write the letter. I do not beg. I do not ask for forgiveness. I do not hold my breath while he finishes. The man tells me he does not love me and he does not love me. The man tells me who he is, and I listen. I have so much beautiful time. Thank you. So um, this is my last poem. But yeah, if you want to come get a book, you can. If you want a shirt, you can come look at it. Um, if, <laughs> I, I'm not, I don't expect you to just buy a fucking shirt. You don't know what it says. You don't know what's on it. Like, what, is, what could it be? Um, but you should come look, maybe. Uh, but you also don't have to buy anything. You can just come say hello. That's fine, too. Thank you for having me. This is a beautiful venue. This is a beautiful poetry slam. And this is a beautiful city, the birthplace of Beyonce. Okay. <laughs> That. I'm sure every teacher says that. All right. I want to write a poem for the women on Long Island yeah! who smoke cigarettes in their SUVs with the windows rolled up before walking into yoga, who hack and curse in Downward Dog and Deborah from the next block over who has strong opinions about Christmas lights after New Year's, who says that her body isn't what it used to be but neither is the economy or the bagels at Rickman's Deli so who really cares, who during Shavasana brings up the rabbi's daughter who got an abortion last spring, and Candy in the corner who is mousy and kind but makes a show of removing her diamond ring before class because it's just too heavy, calls Deborah hateful. And the class takes a sharp inhale through the nose, then out through the mouth. And after class, after Candy rushes home to check the lasagna, Deborah lights up a smoke and calls her best friend Tammy. So then the girl calls me hateful. Hateful, can you believe it? What a word, some kind of dictionary bitch over here. So you know what I said? I said, you don't know the first thing about hateful. Wanna know what's hateful? Menopause. 
And it doesn't really matter if Deborah actually said that to Candy, which she didn't, because Tammy is so caught up that Candy called Deborah hateful, which she did, that next week, when Tammy runs into Candy while shopping in Rockville Center, Tammy will adjust the purse strap on her shoulder and say, we all have a little coal in our stocking, Candy. And Candy will shuffle away, certain that Tammy knows something about her marriage that she shouldn't and she doesn't. She just loves Deborah, who has a lot of opinions. And had Candy given her the chance to finish her sentence, Deborah would have talked about the reproductive rights march she went to in the 60s and the counterproductive sex shaming methods of organized religion. I want to write a poem for the women on Long Island who ask if I have a boyfriend and before I can answer say don't do it. Don't ever do it. You know my friend Linda, she's a lesbian, like a real lesbian. And whenever I go over there, she lives on Corona by Merrick by the laundromat, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, whenever I go over there and see her and a wife, what's her name? I can never remember the girl's name. Anyway, whenever I go over there, I says, you know what I need? I says a girlfriend, that's what I need. The women on Long Island smoke weed once a month on the side of the house after their husbands, Richard, Larry, Gary, Mike, or Tony go to bed. They let their teenage daughters throw parties in the basement while they watch the home network upstairs and keep a bat by the couch in case anyone gets roofied even if it's their own son who did the drugging. The women on Long Island won't put it past any man to be guilty, even their kin, who after all have their husband's hands and blood. And last week, when a girl was murdered while jogging in Queens, the women on Long Island were unstartled and furious. They did not call to warn their daughters. They called their sons, took their car keys, their coats, locked the door and sat them at the kitchen table if you ever and I mean ever so much as make a woman feel uncomfortable, I will take you to the deli and put your hand in the meat slicer. You think I won't? You hear me? I will make a hero out of you with mayonnaise and tomatoes and dill and onions. I want to write a poem for the women on Long Island who, when I show them the knife I carry in my purse, tell me it's not big enough, who are waitresses and realtors and massage therapists and social workers and housewives and nannies and tell me they wish they would have been artists. But life comes fast. One minute you're taking typing classes for your new secretary job in the World Trade Center and the next it's almost over. Life, I mean. But I kicked and screamed my way through it and so will you. I can tell by the way you walk. One more thing, when they call you a bitch, say thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Give it up for your feature tonight, Olivia Gatwood. Go over there, say hello. Ask about a book, ask about a shirt. I bought the book, it's amazing, it's so good. Words are amazing. All right, good night. No, I'm just kidding. We have to decide, we have to figure out who won this poetry slam. So, I have the winners.